this computer. There we go. Hi, everyone. This is the International Humanist uh, Management Association, and this is Teaching Teachers to Teach Values. I am Jennifer Hancock, one of the board members for the USA chapter, and Michael Pearson from Fordham University and our fearless leader is joining us today to talk about how he teaches values in the classroom. Welcome, Michael. Welcome and thank you for this opportunity, Jennifer, and, and others. Welcome. Uh, it, it's good to see you. I, we even have a student that can attest uh, to possibly the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of teaching values in the classroom that I do. Uh, so welcome, Betty. <laughs> and uh, I will start by saying that, in fact, I probably am the wrong person to be speaking to you about this subject because I have failed teaching values in the classroom. And so what I'm gonna be talking about is much what I can share about the failures and, and how I can approach teaching uh, in a way that people are becoming more aware of their own values. I'm not teaching any values, I'm just hopefully providing a space where others can tap into their deeper values and then see how they can possibly benefit from becoming more aware and aligning the values more with the practice of management, the practice of being in the world as somebody that organizes for meaningful purpose. So that is sort of the, the starting point that I feel I have um, failed in my 15 years of teaching to really come to a sweet spot where I can say I can preach values, I can share what the values are, and, and here they are and, and just go with it. Um, I do think there are a couple of core grounding notions that can help. And so I would call that the universalist consensus, which is pretty short, but it's the notion of intrinsic value and that of dignity. We call it dignity, uh, intrinsic value, that life is value. intrinsic value. And so I think those are principles for values based. And then I am earth kind of teaching that I hope I am doing. Um, I typically start with folks sharing like or with sharing what the situation is, different problems that we're facing as a species. And in the end, I hope that sort of gets to a conversation that opens up the importance of values because I would say that many of the problems that we're facing right now are because of a misalignment of our deeply he uh, held human values and the ones that we are uh, um, organizing for. So I'm hearing, I'm seeing connection to that is that for just is it my connection yeah it's saying that um your connection is uh low bandwidth and uh you are breaking up a little bit but for the most part we i'm i'm able to understand what you're talking about but it is breaking up on your end so so i apologize now i thought this would get this all of these technological problems would happen uh, when we are all in lockdown but it happens when we're opening up so yeah, it's, um, it's saying that your network connection is low bandwidth, so. Okay, so triple apologies. I don't know what comes through. I can stop my video. In fact, that's a good idea. And if everybody can switch their video connection to, um, you know, their video setting to take off the enable HD, that might help too, so. All right, Michael, can we still hear you? And I'm, I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try to come up with the other computer now that it took only 20 minutes to reboot. Okay. Maybe that's a better way. So I really apologize. It's okay. Um, uh, what so I, what well, I also wanted to share, mm -hmm. if, if, if that comes through now better, okay, is um, that I had um, at the beginning of my teaching career, sort of an understanding that I have some, some good sort of values. <laughs> and I came into, quote unquote, the belly of the beast, the folks in New York City that wanted to go to Wall Street. And basically that was sort of, quote unquote, my enemy. 
Um, not that I knew that it was, but it turned out that that kind of thinking was part of the problem. And I had very little success in communicating or getting anything across with the type of students. And uh, therefore, I, I had to switch. I had to switch my approach of teaching uh, from an ethics-based, values-based perspective to a very pragmatic perspective. And so what I've been doing ever since is bringing out different notions of human nature and how they work and, and how we work best. And it all comes back to certain values. And uh, it is basically that uh, we honor our dignity, and there is a question about the grounding of dignity. There are a number of, of grounding foundations for this dignity concept. The, the easiest to access are the philosophical, theological, uh, wisdom-based ones. This, those have been most developed, but they typically don't fly with my audience. Uh, in fact, every time I bring up philosophy or uh, religion or all of these things, it's just seen as weakness um, and, and uninformed. What works though very well is using evolution, evolutionary biology, evolutionary insights, and share why our species has uh, survived so far. And ultimately, it, it led me to discovery of many things, including that Darwin himself was already saying that morality and values are the ultimate survival uh, mechanism. So I see I am finally on this other machine. Is this better? Yes. Okay. I apologize again. And uh, so what I, what I typically do, and I don't know if this will work now, because uh, I, I do have a, a four drive framework that I build uh, on in terms of the foundations of dignity. And this is, this is really hardcore evolutionary biology. And it explains the survival of Homo sapiens as a way how our brain developed functions uh, to allow ourselves to be social first, a social species, a fundamentally social species. And that's where Darwin comes in. Darwin says to navigate sociality, to navigate us as a relational species, we need to have some shared agreements, and those are normative ultimately. Those are values based. And so the, the four drive theory is developed by Paul Lawrence, and it says it has these four drives that are the four the drives are the drive to acquire and the drive to defend. Those we all share with all living creatures because we all need to acquire what we need to survive and be able to defend it. And then the drive to bond, which makes us a social tribal species. And most people chuckle when they think that we are social. Uh, and then you bring in the examples that we live in cities, uh, that we uh, are on Facebook, that uh, when we are in isolation like we are experiencing now, we're typically not very happy. And that the worst punishment that we have invented for ourselves is isolation. And so when people get that, they sort of start understanding that this is a core of, of us. And then that the problem of navigating sociality becomes one is like, how do you come up with rules, i.e. values that allow you to be benefiting from sociality uh, and, and a, our tribal nature? And then of course there are downsides to that tribal nature, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do Homo sapiens, that means that Paul Lawrence says the drive to bond, the drive for us to be social is not enough. We needed to have an, a drive to be uh, adaptive to various changes in the environment, and that was what gave rise to the uh, drive to comprehend what made us sapiens, what made us ask the question why we're doing things a certain way and that gave rise to innovation, et cetera, et cetera. So the drive to acquire, the drive to, comp uh, to defend as the baseline, the drive to bond as a, as a third one, and the drive to comprehend as the fourth one. And the drive to comprehend also gets at this notion of why we're doing things 
uh, which is often a values question. Like, and, and therefore it becomes sort of part of the overall conversation on how we are able as a species to survive better and flourish. And that's where um, pretty much all the wisdom traditions uh, concur. And I draw on the work of Hans Küng, who has been studying all the world religion traditions and sort of come up with what they share, what they have in common. And it's this principle of humanity or the principle of dignity that we all honor uh, life. Ultimately, <laughs> we wish to honor, we fail a lot, but that's what, uh, what is the, the normative narrative and uh, the golden rule that we would be treat, want to be treated uh, like others uh, treat us. Sorry, that we would want to be, uh, that we treat others like we want to be treated. Hans Küng is his name. So that is fundamentally then values-based and value-based. But the way that I am able to approach it and present it to the students, it is going through this pragmatic lens of survival. And most of the hardcore uh, Wall Street, Wolf of Wall Street types, they, they can even see that as, as valuable. And then the question becomes a different one in terms of where that shows up. And then the question that I typically ask is about excellence. So the typical Aristotelian virtue-based conversation, what is human excellence? What is team excellence? What is organizational excellence? And whenever you go into this excellence question, then you automatically come up with the challenge of values and what values people have and which values are more functional, quote unquote, than others. And typically the values that are more functional are the ones that are more universal and uh, inclusive, that honor dignity, that honor people as people. and uh, then therefore allow uh, more flourishing as well. So this is uh, my way of going through the back door using a scientific perspective, a pragmatic perspective. Um, and I just wanted to mention uh, the work of um, Mary Gentile that some of you probably know of. That, that influenced me to a, to a degree where she is saying, you know, what I learned from teaching at Harvard is that all the ethics frameworks, they don't teach people values. They, don't, they teach people at best how to rationalize. And Mary Gentile, yeah. Uh -huh. And her work is called Giving Voice to Values. So basically she says flipping it, um, not helping people to rationalize, but just become much more aware of their own values and the values of others, and how to give voice to their values is much more powerful. It's like brain training, uh, and we all have certain values. We are not very aware of them sometimes, and we're certainly not uh, able all the time to give voice to them. And so she drew on the research of the Holocaust and people that were in, in other very dire situations then actually be able to stand up for their values uh, and says that this was basically a habit and a practice for them way before they, they were tested. So they were able to voice their values, give voice to their values way before. So this is where, uh, where I have shifted in my teaching to sort of taking a values-based approach to come, becoming more pragmatic and allowing people to understand and give voice to their values. I do a lot of reflection exercises uh, and, and let people sort of use that space to express themselves. Uh, I leave it at that and, and maybe we can have a conversation. So some of the questions, uh, because you've said several times you're not teaching values as much as you're teaching what exactly? <laughs> you said it's coming in the back door, so I'm uh, giving us, I'm teaching organizing. I'm teaching management, right? I'm teaching principles of management in various forms. And, and those are the principles of management, managerial excellence. And, and that would include sustainable business, social enterprise. It would include a number of the, the subjects that I think are yeah, part of a values-based uh, approach to, to business but I am not teaching business ethics. In fact, when people are talking to me or asking uh, in terms of like, what, what is 
the best way to teach ethics. I think I, I just don't know. <laughs> Uh, and I feel the business ethics field needs to die. Uh, I, I was recently interviewed for a business ethics chair and said, what's your vision? I said that there is no chair. Of course, I didn't get that chair. But, uh, <laughs> but the point is that ethics is part of everything. It needs to be woven into everything. But ethics in itself is useless to me too. It's just a conversation about imaginary trolley dilemma or something like that and and that's a good philosophical conversation but it's ultimately I found very unpredictable. Gotcha I kind of when I think of these things myself um, it's more about what is a good outcome and that sounds like what you're talking about when you're talking about what is organizational excellence mean that that's something people can reflect on and think about okay obviously whatever it is has to work but what does it mean by working Right. And by having that conversation, the, the what we call ethics is being woven in automatically to the conversation. Am I reflecting back what the approach is? Absolutely. So the, the why question is to me the ethics question. I typically say for management, we had the traditional two F's or whatever, effectiveness and efficiency as the criteria for what, for what is good. Right. What is good management? And increasingly, we, we're, we're wondering, it's the, it's the what and the, and the how that we're addressing. But we've forgotten the why. And you know that there are many people out there that are saying why is so important, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the ethics question, right? And so why are we in such problems as a species? I think it's because we have forgotten to really ask the deeper why question. And if we did, then we probably would have fewer problems. We would, in that sense, uh, allow our species to survive, <laughs> flourish, etc., better. And um, we would uh, use the power of ethics to inform how we answer why. So that kind of leads into Gerard Farias' uh, question early on, which is you mentioned the drive to acquire. Um, so that would be like an efficiency issue, but is our problem limiting the acquisition motive or is it something else like balancing the drives? Well, so that's the main key of this theoretical framework. It's about balancing. It's not about either or. It's about both and, uh, which allows us to actually survive. And I think that's where I came from with the business ethics perspective or my values-based perspective. I was... I think I was perceived by others to say uh, the acquisition is bad, <laughs> that um, consumption is not good, that uh, we are flawed human beings because we consume, stuff like that. And, and I, I've seen this over and over in many other conversations that I'm part of where it's like basically we human beings suck. That's the ultimate tenor. I think that's what, what comes across. There's a lot of self-loathing or human loathing. Uh, and, and that um, I, I feel I, I contributed to with this whole business ethics conversation and the downplaying of our need to consume. So it's not about a maximization of consumption, of course, but it's not about the reduction of consumption as the ultimate goal either. It's about how we consume and why we consume and what we consume, of course. And, uh, and that we are human, I think, that sort of the whole survival perspective, this is just part of it. We, we, we need that. And we're doing a bad job at surviving by maximizing the acquisition the way we're doing. So it's just stupid. Um, and, and, and I then leave it at that. So that's where the pragmatism comes in, right? Um, the next question is, um, Sherazad says, we're all part of a higher force, the, the light and spirituality. So I guess, how do you deal with um, religious beliefs or non-beliefs uh, of the students in your classroom? Or does that Not come up all. at all? Not at all, I don't. I, I feel highly incompetent and even, the spiritual language, I, I typically, I, I can borrow it. I cannot speak it or do not want to speak it in a way. Uh, what I do sometimes, because we're at a Jesuit school, 
uh, I do refer to the Jesuit principles and say, all right, here is the, the care for the whole person. Here's what it means to be excellent. Here is these kind of things that uh, say in service to others. So that would be a principle of excellence ultimately, because if you are looking at all the religious principles and that, that comes up in, in pretty, pretty much every spiritual tradition, uh, you have the notion of service to others. You have the notion of caring for the whole human being in, in not only the material way. Um, and then you have the way that your contribution or your purpose is something to contribute to something bigger than yourself. And, and so when you go back to that and you showcase all the data of the teams that work best, the organizations that work best, then it's like, ah, yeah, duh. The, the ancient wisdom is pretty anti-fragile. That's a, a, a term, I, I forget now the, the, uh, the, uh, the author, uh, Nassim Taleb, I think, um, that he uses for everything that has been around for a long time, that's anti-fragile it is in some way performative, it is helpful, it is pragmatically useful. So those wisdom insights from the, tradition, from the, the ancient wisdom traditions are very helpful. I, I have very big trouble speaking to people that want to go to Wall Street at age 19 to speak about religious or the light, that we're all part of the light, or all of this. They're, they're shutting down, they're shutting down. Uh, that's not what they signed up for. And, and every time I, I come into this corner, I become less effective as a teacher of this particular crowd. I'm not saying this is holds for everybody, but I'm just sharing you, my perspective that was coming in and had no trouble when I was teaching up at Harvard or something. That was not a, pro not a problem. That was maybe a different kind of population. <clears throat> but teaching this particular group that, uh, that seems to be more of the American mainstream uh, was a little bit, uh, th that would not have worked. Well, it didn't work, I can tell you that. From my so I guess you're obviously bringing in um, different value frameworks for people to consider. Um, and I'm assuming some of those frameworks do come from the anti-fragile traditions, which include various faith traditions. So are you bringing them in kind of as comparative for people to consider as opposed to uh, prescriptive you shall like how do you is that how you're balancing it I'm just trying to understand because it's obvious you're bringing things in I'm just wondering how yes I typically reduce it to two frameworks right and I think others that that may have read my work are a little bit familiar I use the, the framing of the economistic uh, mindset and that humanistic mindset right and the economistic mindset um, is legitimate in many ways and has been pervasive for a number of reasons, good reasons too. Uh, and it assumes us as being act maximizers, right? Utility maximizers. So, and I think that's, that's the foundation of the neoliberal paradigm or neo rentist paradigm uh, that, that is currently showcasing as dysfunctional. Uh, and I just showcase that is in that sense, uh, a useful tool to think about people, um, especially if you think about people as a species. And, and it may not be the most accurate one. And then I showcase the humanistic one, the four drive based one, et cetera, et cetera. And then I show the data and then I show this, this can work and this can work. Uh, I, I, I'm positioning, I am not referencing much a relativist cultural framework. So I'm not saying anything goes. I'm not saying uh, we're not we're we're not we're we're not interested in human nature. There are many business ethics uh, professors and and other thinkers that are saying human nature doesn't exist. Uh, therefore, we don't need to talk about it. Human nature can be anything. Um, and culture can shape us into anything, and any cultural value is equally relevant and valid, and so we're, that's the conversation. I am not doing that. I'm staying away from that. I'm using two universalist frameworks uh, and compare them. And then it's obvious that I prefer the, the humanist one. I'm clear about it, but I'm also share, sh showcasing that it's from a pragmatic perspective, just a, a more functional one. So I guess, you know, we have other questions, but I want to follow up on this real quick, um, that 
I guess the question that the overarching question is, if someone is teaching a strategy class or um, a marketing class or whatever class, can they use these sorts of um, frameworks to help them inject a moral consideration for their students on top of whatever the lesson is? Well, my take is they should. That's the ultimate question, right? It's like, what is the value of this product if it's finance? What's the value of investing in this in this uh, company, etc.? Does it align? This is the conversation that's actually going on right now. The big conversation with Larry Fink asking companies to identify their higher social purpose. This is not just a business ethics thing. This is fundamentally finance. This is finance to the core. This is marketing to the core. This is all of organizing to its core repositioned or challenged by this ethical question of why are you doing what you're doing and what is your contribution to the world and so i think that's the the gift right now in this current times that things have gone so bad that nobody can avoid the the ethical question and it's sort of the last resort where we can come back to reflection and say all right are we doing the right things and I think that's relevant for finance, marketing, production, any of those. And while they have been able, successfully able to be, quote unquote, scientifically amoral, that's the, that's the, um, the framework, the economistic framework that they're built on, I think that the humanistic framework allows them to connect to the moral question. And when I'm saying moral or normative question, I'm not saying that there is the right question and we're going to just preach dogma. No, 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 just being open to the question that there is an importance to how you answer uh, why. And that why is a relevant question to ask. And I think that's, that's the difference. It's not, not about a dogmatic piece. It's not about replacing one dogma with another and go down preaching this way, this way, this way, but allowing, like giving voice to values, the space for people to explore the question within the context of marketing, finance, logistics, whatever it may be. Jennifer, you're mute. I'm trying, to, um, Ravi Chinta, that extra noise I think is coming from Ravi at the moment and for some reason it's not letting me mute him. Um, so Ravi, if you can self mute, that would be great. Uh, the next questions have to do with self-reflection and uh, reflection exercises that you provide. So, um, you know, Andre wanted to know if you have experimented with self-reflexivity and the role of emotions in shaping value conversations. And that ties into Elaine Long's questions of, can you give us some examples of reflex uh, reflection exercises? Wow, good questions. Um, so basically, I just let people it, typically reflect on what they have learned in the session before and after each class. And then that content may speak to people in so many different ways. And, and oftentimes when I see in, in the reflections, it's, it starts out very shallow. And I, that's to be expected. And it's oftentimes not because people are shallow, but because they don't know what is expected in the class and how, how that class uh, would sort of engage their whole self in that reflection. But typically what happens, and, and maybe uh, Betty can, uh, can, can uh, share what, what her experience was, uh, but it, it does in the end provide a lot of other folks being willing to be vulnerable and share their actual values and not their pretend values. There's a lot of surface sharing in the very beginning where it's like, yeah, as business people, we're supposed to do this and blah, blah, blah. And then ultimately when it comes down to like, what do you think, then it's very difficult to reflect on it in, in that way. It's just like, there's nothing there there uh, for most people. And so at some point they, they, they go to their own values. And they say, I, I really like that comment about this because it spoke to me in my experience here. And so it's just, I think, that uh, space that allows students to engage. Then there are all kinds of other uh, prompting exercises uh, for, for, certain, for certain aspects in terms of the individual excellence piece, the team excellence, organizational excellence is difficult. Um, 
but societal excellence, if, if you ask people what they care about or what, they, what bothers them most in the world, you'll see a lot of things that show up where it's like, this is totally value-based and this is who you are. So why not develop in, in that more? Betty, did you want to share something? You, I mean, My guess is Ravi Chinta. I, I have a, I think the tussle here is between self-determination. I choose what I want to do because this is, uh, the context in which I'm logged in, and these are my personal beliefs, personal faiths, and so forth. So that self-determination at work, uh, the choice is made by me, given all the knowledge that I have. And the tussle is between that self-determination and the humanistic value system, which is pre pretty much indisputable. It's so good. Nobody in this forum says anything bad about it. It's so good, and that, that's why I'm drawn to it. The humanistic uh, uh, realm, the management realm is so good, indisputable, incontrovertible. So that's more like a universal, universalistic benchmark out there, which we have to emulate and adopt and implement in the way we work. That's the tussle here I, I see. The problem with, that's why I keep talking about trade-offs. You know. Jennifer has talked about strategy. I teach strategy. I've been teaching it for nearly 30 years. And we talk about this all the time. There is a triple bottom line. There is profitability, then corporate social responsibility, then ecological conservatism. There are several stakeholders out there and we need to balance the interests of various stakeholders. And we try to transcend from profitability realm so robbie other... i'm going to interrupt you real quick uh michael had asked his uh betty to chime in on what happens in the classroom so um and we're asking people to mute themselves so that the the conversation the questions can all be asked so um i don't there we go i was able to mute you there we go um so betty i think michael had a question for you uh michael can you re redo that well, I want to go back to Ravi's comment okay. in a moment, but yes, just to sort of to close the loop, I was just responding to the question about how you give space to values or how what the reflection exercise are. I was just sharing a, a baseline thing, and I think Betty, you went through that in the and there's another comment here about how do you do that in the asynchronous blended learning context. That was a class, right, Betty? You were in that uh, asynchronous learning class. You want to share a little bit just how that worked or not? Let me worked? see if I can unmute. Yeah, I can unmute myself. Good. So um, in the asynchronous, um, we usually have a um, expectations. Usually each week we have the reflection at the end of the asynchronous materials. And then for the start of the week, we have another um, reflections that is like a written as part of the response. Um, and I think the reflection part works. So works very well for me. I, and and, and, and um, Dr. Peterson's has, has different reflections kind of built on into the midterms and also in the finals. And it, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm listening to him right now and it bring me back to the whole class. I really miss that class actually. And, and I can say um, the, the way he, he framed it exactly had him mentioned. Um, it, it, yeah, it's not about the religion approach, it's about the philosophy, about the full drive and about balancing it. And, and I have to tell you, I, I, I speak to other students. I know some of them didn't get it at first. Um, and I would tell you after two semesters, six months later, they come back like, oh, I missed him. I missed that class. <laughs> I actually learned something from that class. Like people didn't get it at first. And I think I got it because I, I, I'm searching for that value myself. And that's why I'm drawn and, 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 and coming back to the humanistic network. Um, and, and other people didn't really looking for it. And until after they took the class and I think, Slowly, they they see that in the work, um, or, or other other schoolwork, and and I, I think Fordham did pretty good job in other um, classes that kind of did build in the question, uh, keep questioning of the why, so also kind of trigger people to think, um, like why are we doing this? And so I'm just gonna add that. Thank you, Michael. Did you want to respond, or can, should we move on to the next question? Well, yeah, no, I mean, it, it's good to hear a very, your perspective. And in, in some way, of course, as a professor, I see at least only the development within class from, let's say, from class one to class 10 or from class 14.
2015. And I think I can see that there is a little bit more engagement with, with or willingness for people to engage. Whatever they take away is a whole different question, right? And, and I guess all of us that teach, the hope is that at some point they'll come back to it and say, all right, this was actually useful. This could be helpful. So that's why I took this more pragmatic perspective. Like this is actually very useful. Like seeing the world that way can help you understand when you're going to uh, run into trouble, when you have problems, or like Ravi was saying, trade off potential conversations. And I just wanted to respond to Ravi's suggestion. And I think there may be some disagreement that I have with the whole interest in trade off conversations. And, and I do think that the dignity based conversation can allow you to transcend the interest based conversation. Because we're always assuming that people have all these interests and they're all so rational and they can provide them clearly at the table in negotiations and other things. Most people don't have those interests clearly formulated. Most of our sort of interests, quote unquote, are a dignity related um, in a sense that we, we, we just expect to be honored in, uh, in being human and not treated as a tool. Uh, and if somebody else comes in and sort of treats us as a tool, a human resource or some kind of stakeholder, I think we're already devaluing them. And I think the whole stakeholder conversation risks, uh, uh, risks that. It's like stakeholder, stakeholder interest and then trade-offs. That's just like, you know what, get a machine, get, a, uh, get an algorithm. They can also specify this and then AI can do it for you. I think that's already on its way and I think that's problematic and uh, I think that therefore this this dignity based framework of intrinsic value not of explicit in, uh, interests uh, can help you at a deeper level to to create the kind of communities that you need the team uh, uh, or the relations that you need to to really make the better decisions whatever they may be. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and then. Right, um, there's another question uh, for Sherazad. It says, what is the difference between values and ethics and do you make, basically do you make a distinction between the two? That's a good question. I'm not the one that is best equipped to answer this. I'm, I'm not sure how many business ethics uh, professionals are on, on the call, uh, I'd assume some. But for me, the, the difference that I'm making is between morality and ethics. And I think everybody has a moral, moral set, some kind of thing. Even if it's the Wolf of Wall Street, the, the moral, moral kind of set is uh, me getting more is better than others having more, something like that, right? That's a kind of individual morality value set, you can say. Um, is it ethical? Ethical, I would argue, needs to be something that's universally applicable, like a Kantian kind of uh, paradigm that's like, if you do that, if that value set, if were that was to be used for everyone on earth, is that a workable one? And clearly that kind of psychopathic uh, value set doesn't work for everyone. It's fundamentally dysfunctional for survival of the species. That's why most of us aren't psychopaths. And that's why we care about each other. And, and that's what you need to tap into if, if you're smart. And I think that's where the ethics comes in. That's the, that's the why thing. So this is for me the difference between values can be just any value, shareholder value or whatever. Uh, but the ethics for me is the kind of thing that, that cuts across. Is it functional for the entire species if everybody applied it? Uh, going back to uh, Gerard, he said that uh, one of his, his follow-up question is, doesn't business play into the drive to consume? And I guess the follow-up question I have to that is, what responsibility do we have um, as either business professionals or as business educators to, uh, to address that, the unbalance that occurs, I guess? Mm. No, I think we do have a big responsibility. I mean, I think that's where much of where we as a species are going wrong is coming from this quote unquote legitimacy that let's say business schools or the business degree confers onto people uh, that uh, I think even in politics is playing a role at the highest level. We vote regularly for business people uh, because somehow business experience is, is critical. Um, we can see the downsides of that, I think. 
Uh, and and then uh, for me, it, yes, you can say that business education is about teaching people how to consume, how to produce, all of these things. Now, that's in itself nothing bad. We had a lot of agricultural schools, et cetera, and that was all good. We wanted to have more produce and all that. That was all, all okay to a certain degree. Um, so we do produce and we do consume. Uh, obviously, we're doing a bad job at consuming now because all of, I think more than 90% of our consumption is landing in trash uh, two weeks after buying or six months after buying it. So that's, that's just not a very helpful consumption pattern. And clearly that's where business school is, is, is needed to, to rethink all of that and say, this is just bad consumption, this is bad production, uh, this is stupid. In the end, this is just not smart. It's wasteful uh, and it's, it's hurting. So let me, let me follow up on this. One of my uh, you know, first mentors in business in a, in a franchising situation, said that the business of business is to get more and more customers to buy more and more of your products and services more and more frequently. Um, so is there a problem with how we're conceiving of what business is? Um, and how would you resp have responded to this guy? I mm -hmm. No, and I think there, is all, there are all kinds of stories around of what business is. Business is bad. Business is uh, cheating. Business is uh, getting more customers. The purpose of business is business, whatever that may mean. There are all these narratives out there, many of them very ill-informed, very dysfunctional. And yes, you can make money. And if, if you think you're, the purpose of business is to make money, okay, that's your purpose. But then the question is why? Why is that? Is that excellence? So this is where I come back to the excellence question because yes, all of this can be business. Is it good business? Is it excellence? No, it's not, clearly not. Uh, just having people buy more stuff that they don't need that they then put in garbage is no good. Uh, it's not even good for the people that consume it or for the people that sell it. Now that consciousness needs to arise and it's not very present yet, but it becomes more and more, uh, I think, uh, prevalent. And you have the rise of conscious capitalism, you have the rise of B Corps, you have the business round table statement, you have the major investors saying, you know what, this is not good enough, this is not good, we, you are a risky business. And so I so do think these, we're at a turning point. Yeah, are these questions that you ask during the reflection sessions that you have when people bring things up and are you, you, do you just play devil's advocate to them? I'm thinking, you know, as a, a teaching teachers to teach values, how do they get the courage to have these conversations with their students? I take a very hands-off approach. I, I do follow more or less uh, marriage and Taylor, giving voice to values. Give people the space to voice their values. I th I'm drawing on my own experience. When did I learn the most about that? It was not in class. It was with my peers. It was with my peers over lunch or somehow maybe in a chat room or something when you could feel like there was nobody judging you. And I think that's the biggest problem of business ethics that I personally also feel judged. You know, it's like, oh, okay, this is a bad value. Is that is you're a bad person? And then there's a professor that teaches you about doing this. Like, oh, no, I don't want to be taught about this by some guy that I don't know, uh, that I don't respect. I have no reason to, uh, <laughs> etc. And so I think that all of these things, I have at least come um, in my in, in that specific domain where I teach. Uh, to be actually hurdles to get people at the values question. So I do prompt and I do ask people to think about it and have conversations. And I think that's where I leave it. I provide the spaces for people to give voice to their values and then to share that with them, with each other. Excellent. So uh, Ralitza asked, um, have you thought what components of value conversations would work particularly well in a blended learning context? 
So again, as Betty was saying, we did this in an online class. So basically in an online class, what I've sensed, and I was very skeptical about teaching online or asynchronous or hybrid. Um, on the other hand, what I found is you can much, much better program and structure the way uh, the content is coming and the content is perceived. And you can interject it with questions and prompts uh, that you couldn't do in a typical class. And so I do think, yes, all of these prompts and giving voice to value spaces, you can provide and you can seed in the asynchronous environment. You can uh, share any kind of video. We're doing this by now, but interesting uh, experience. We're working with Sesame Street, the former cast and current cast members. And I think uh, while it wouldn't come across so much for the kids, but Sesame Street is a values-based educational program, but it's an educational program. And uh, it was successful. It is successful because it speaks to kids in their language, in their way, and allows them to be. And uh, there is a cookie monster uh, and, and everybody loves the cookie monster, but nobody's telling them, oh no, you shouldn't eat chocolate chip cookies because they're too many calories and it's bad for you. No, no, that's not, not really the kind of thing. Uh, but there is a character there that sort of like gives them an outlet to this and then reflect on their own behavior. And we're looking at this right now. We're scripting uh, scripts for Sesame Street for business students using a similar kind of way. And it's the, the humor aspect there that helps people to address these issues. We can see the kind of conflicts that we see in the classroom or that we see happening in the world out there through puppets. So it's like, it's not a person and, and you don't have to get into the conflict of, of the ethics uh, uh, directly. You can use sort of another space and create another space where people can observe. And I think when you can do that, when you can show a video where that is happening or where can you produce the content yourself, that's perfect for asynchronous. Then you can see the conversation that way. You can build the characters that way. We have four characters. One is the, the jock. A character, the Wolf of Wall Street wannabe. The other is the high idealist that's very ineffective uh, in, in changing the world. Then the third one is a social butterfly who is directionless and aimless. And the fourth character is, um, um, oh, um, uh, the fourth character is, oh, I forget now. It's, uh, but but uh, they're, they're, we, we sort of see those characters and I think in asynchronous content, you can do this. You can pull videos easily where you say, all right, here's this one person that expresses a certain value set. Here's another person. So what, what do you think? How do you react to that? Is that manager something that you, that you find is, is, is saying something use, useful to you? And why would it be? And I'm just coming across this right now. I'm using this masterclass app, I guess. <laughs> There's a story by, by Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks. All he talks is about values. So it's like, I don't need to preach. I don't need to talk. I let those people do the talking. And then there is a, the founder of Spanx. I don't know what, uh, forget her name, but Sarah Blakely, I think, or something. Those are inventors of um, rather traditional businesses, you would say but they're all sourcing from very deep spiritual values. And when you share that with the people, it's like, okay, you know what? This typical traditional dichotomy of you can't be successful if you're good, it's transcended. You can see it. Those are not bad people. You don't have to agree with Starbucks or you don't have to agree with Spanx or whatever, but the overarching premise is, is wiped out saying that you can't be uh, values-based and a uh, good business person. So I think for the uh, asynchronous content, there's, I mean, the more I look at it, it's like, it, the, it's actually much better uh, to prompt these conversations. So the follow-up is by Elaine and she says, do you have students share these reflections on a discussion board or on a live Zoom meeting? Both, uh, because in a way I force them to write it, uh, and then other people can read it. I think, Betty, right? That's uh, you. You could read the others. I, I don't remember reading the others. I thought it was only for you that particular. Uh -oh. We do, we do okay. share reflection on um, in the live class. Right. 
And then in the live class, whoever feels like sharing, um, and uh, and in in the way that I've done this three times now, not a not an expert, but I find that the online uh, synchronous experience is at least as rich as the in class uh, experience, especially because most of the students are much better prepared, and and uh, they are prompted to think about certain things, and they can share certain conversations that um, that I I think yeah it, it sort of it, it is it is the the distinction between th um, hybrid learning and in person learning is is actually it's not there or it's actually it, you can enhance the overall learning experience in the uh, hybrid context when you give the spaces for people to to share on that. That's my experience. So Martina asked, how do you encourage your students to value themselves? Well, that's a very good question. And then, I mean, by that, I feel like by doing that, by taking themselves as a reference point and their own experience and just learning, and, and it, it seems to be for many people, and I don't know, Betty, your colleagues, et cetera, uh, they dismiss it in the very beginning. It's like, who am I? Uh, like, what do I know? I'm just a student, um, and, and here are the experts, and I want to see what the experts say. It's like, no, no, actually, I'm not interested in what the experts say. I know what the experts say. I'm interested in what you say. And, and every now and then, people get to the point, it's like, okay, yeah, this is actually important what I say. This is actually helpful in my learning experience. It takes them quite a bit, I feel. <laughs> but, but ultimately, and maybe, Betty, you want to just chime in. Is that an experience that you've had? Because you, you were asked so often to reflect on it. Didn't that elevate at least your own reflection perspective and just forced you into taking yourself a little bit more seriously? I don't know. But that, that, was, that is my hypothesis. I think it did. I think it, it did um, in a sense that because you start asking yourself, you, you ask us the question of why. Why are we doing this? What are we doing? And it does make you reflect. And I do agree, the hybrid of having asynchronous and live, it gives us the space to think about it. Um, and then having that live sessions to kind of reinforce it. Um, because you will ask us. <laughs> so that, that, that was helpful. And I think um, speaking to my other classmate that in this cohort, um, we, at least some of them I know, they were put off in the beginning. like. What is this? Like, why are we doing this? And I think so they come to like, oh, I missed that class. Like it was so much more, the content is so much more useful than just learning the subject itself because of the questions of asking our own value, our role in this particular subject. And, and I want to assume or the hypothesis to be tested is like the more you make it your own, the more you learn it, the better you learn it, right? And, and if, you, if you bake that values conversation, I think even into marketing or finance, then it just becomes much more of what you can actually claim is your own knowledge. So um, I... I don't know if Betty wants to ask, answer that, but we have five minutes left and I wanted to ask one final question. And this is my own question. Um, it, when you ask for this feedback, obviously at the beginning, there's gonna be reluctance until people get in, used to this is part of the course. Um, but in a live session, how do you handle or do you worry about people who withhold and don't participate in the discussion, either written or you know, speaking up? Do you, do you make sure everybody has space to at least chime in, or do you allow people to be silent? It depends. When I have 10 students and uh, it's just awkward if somebody doesn't speak. I mean, it's very obvious that somebody's uncomfortable sharing their values because they've never done so because they haven't reflected because obviously they are, they're just sort of skating or, or surfing the wave of, of uh, whatever, of unreflected <laughs> uh, uh, being. Um, others are just giving them permission, I believe, to think about alternatives and I would prompt everybody to do it. 
I do it in the asynchronous uh, and, and I evaluate it. It's in the syllabus and then if you don't, it's part of your participation. And if you're not willing to, to go deeper and be more vulnerable and more reflective, then it's just not, it's not good participation. Nobody can learn from that. Um, and they the least. So I have a couple students that are sort of saying, but yeah, I should get an A. It's like, well, I'm sorry, but you, your, your contribution wasn't really all that, that deep and helpful. And so that's, uh, I don't know if that is an answer to the question, but that's sort of uh, how I, I typically do it in a space with more students. It's just not possible to have everybody, but I, I'd like to try to get everybody to speak and, and also ask those that are, have an easier time to speak, sometimes to step back and let those uh, speak that, that wouldn't typically speak. Um, Michael, people are asking you to put your contact information. If you feel comfortable in um, the chat room, I've given your name and your university. All you have to do is obviously type in and, and people will find you on um, your bio page. Do you have any final thoughts of wisdom of that you would like to give the other um, instructors and teachers about the experience of teaching values or giving them the courage to attempt some of these things? So I feel I have very little wisdom. I'm actually looking for other people around that notion how to do it. I know Gerard, you sort of questioned the term of excellence and you say responsibility to others. I, I could say that in certain contexts that, that would work. Uh, I am just operating in, a, I guess, in the lion's den, so to speak, which is good training. <laughs> it's like working with people that are very young, unreflective and still totally uh, wanna be uh, Gordon Gecko. And, and it's very difficult to, to get them to do any of the things that we're talking about, especially values-based conversations. So I have to find a backdoor conversation to get to them, which in some way allows me to be talking to CEOs and others because some of them have the same kind of framework, even though I would say that the CEOs by now are much more open to speaking about values than any of the 19 year old wannabe uh, uh, Gordon Geckos. So I do think this is the toughest audience, the young underreflected uh, wannabe Gordon Gecko. And then anybody that doesn't have experience in business is just conjuring up uh, an image of what business is. And, and that's very hard then to counter that because there's no experience there. They have nothing uh, to ground their perspective in. I have very ideological students that come up with some kind of piece of ideology they haven't thought through. It's very underdeveloped, but it just keep blurping that back. So I'm just sharing with you that I would want to learn from you how you find it effective and maybe how we can continue this conversation because uh, I have no wisdom and I have a lot of frustration I can share that. <laughs> right, well that's why we wanted to do this series. Last month we had David Wasilewski on um, from Duquesne. I think next month is Elizabeth Castillo over at Arizona State University. Um, we're trying to have a variety of different educators um, come on so we can have this conversation about how we teach values in the classroom because I don't think there's a right way to do it. I think there's various tricks and tools and methodologies that could be brought to the fore. So by having a variety of people come in and have this conversation, you know, we create kind of a syllabus that people can take a course with a variety of different educators and then that will inform how they approach their own work as educators in the classroom regardless of the methodology whether it's online or hybrid or in person or, or whatever so we're planning to continue this as i said next month we've got elizabeth castillo um i'm going to be one of the guests i think in august uh and i don't teach in the classroom i teach online to working professionals i'm continuing education uh teacher so we're just trying to get a variety of people in if you have people or you want to volunteer yourself um, contact me <laughs> I'm gonna put my email in the chat as well and um, and then we'll have more conversations but we hope to see you on next time <laughs>